Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is episode number 19, uh, studying the topic of heaven. And if you haven't seen the previous 18 episodes, they're available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Each episode is uh, about two hours long, so you can see we've already spent 36 hours studying heaven. It, that might be amazing to you if you're just watching this for the first time because uh, most people think uh, there's not that much to learn about heaven, uh, not that much to say, but it's a huge topic and it's the most joyful topic that I've ever been part of a discussion of. It just, it just makes me so excited about my future. So please go back and watch the other episodes and uh, I want you to know, uh, meet the panelists. Uh, we have Brother Mitch, introduce yourself. Oh uh, yeah, I'm Brother Mitch. Uh, I have a channel, Mitchell Bill. Name you can find that on Luke's channel. Also another channel called James Bondage. If you want to check that out, James Bondage, um, where I have, um, you know, I've made some special videos about the the uh, the Book of James. So um, uh, glad to be here. I definitely would love to talk about heaven for the next hour or two, probably for the next few days. Yes. Okay. Uh, brother, I'm glad, always glad when you can join us. Uh, so if you're not already a subscriber, please subscribe to, to Mitch's two YouTube channels, Mitchell Belenkoff, and his newest channel is uh, James Bondage. And it's a, you're, you're going to get some uh, interesting, uh, fantastic new insights to the book of James if you do that. And we also have uh, uh, Brother Austin. Introduce yourself. Hey everybody, how you doing? This is Austin. Uh, my channel's name is Austin Bell. I run an online ministry called Christ Ministries, and I'm uh, glad to say that I finally got videos on my uh, channel, and I'm uh, looking forward to have many more. So thank you. Yes, yes. Please subscribe to Brother Austin's uh, channel. Uh, he's got a couple of videos up now. He just started. He's basically been observing and participating by making comments and uh, lending a lot of encouragement and insights through his comments. Now he's reached the point where he wants to uh, do some Bible teaching of his own and uh, his first two videos were fantastic. So I look forward to a lot more from Austin in the future. So please subscribe to his channel. It's Austin Bell. Okay, so we'll continue in the, in the study and um, we are working our way through a book written by Randy Alcorn. His title is Heaven by Randy Alcorn. And we're basically reading the book and discussing it. And uh, it's, it's amazing uh, how helpful this book is because he spent many years researching this topic. And so it's a great guide for us to go through this study on heaven. Now, yeah, let me find where we left off last time. Okay. We are on chapter 23, and it, one of the things I like about Randy Alcorn's book is that it's full of questions. Uh, every chapter begins with a question, and within the chapter there are probably you know five or ten more questions, uh, and that's why the the name of this series is Heaven: All Your Questions Answered. So all the things you've asked about heaven, wondered, uh, I think will be have been addressed in this study. So the question at the beginning of chapter 23 is, will the new earth be an Edenic paradise? First, before we go into this, let me just get your first reaction to that question, uh, brothers. What, what's your impression? Uh, do you think that his, how would you answer that question? Will the new earth be an Edenic paradise? No, the, in the first place, I would say, that uh, God created the garden and put the man and the woman in the garden. And uh, there's no reason why, since the earth has been groaning since the time of the fall, that he won't turn the whole earth into a garden. It, it makes sense. I mean, why would, it, why would he leave the earth in the state that it's in and put this small corner of heaven there? It's paradise, and Jesus said it was paradise, and ah, rest in that. Yes. Well, it's... Um there's a, a book written by someone famous years ago. I can't remember the, the author's name, but it's called Paradise Lost. And uh, it, it's, the, it's the story of, of uh, the fall, Adam and Eve's fall, losing paradise, and then paradise regained. 
And that's what we're talking about now is the fact that we're going to regain this paradise and the earth will be renewed and uh, made like it was originally with a garden. But we, we suspect it will be even better than the original. Uh, Brother uh, Austin, what's your first response to this question? Will the Edenic uh, earth, will the new earth be an Edemic paradise? Can I just get uh, some clarification real fast? And what, what does the word Edenic mean? Uh, Edenic. Uh, it's it's a word. It's a word. I guess Randy Elkhorn made up. The root word is Eden. Eden. In other words, will it be like Eden? Okay. Uh, yes, I believe so. Yes. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, oh yes. Let's uh, uh, let's welcome uh, Brother Jackson. He looks like he just joined us. Can you hear us, uh, Brother Jackson? Camera's lost in the outer darkness <laughs> with wailing and gnashing of teeth. Yes, yeah, brother, don't worry. Uh, you're you're a saved believer, and uh, you, you're going to have the same future as the rest of us uh, in this uh, new heavens and new earth. You're not going to be some second-class believer cast into outer darkness as some would teach. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Brother Jackson, uh, before we, we're just getting started, so why don't you just introduce yourself uh, to everybody. All right, everyone. My name is Jackson. My YouTube channel is Mecha Wing Zero, and I've been uploading some features I've found helpful recently and everything. The latest is uh, Hank Lindstrom's brief thing he said about creation. So. Yes. Brother, I watched that... Uh, about an hour ago. It was very interesting uh, to us. Uh, I hope everybody will subscribe to uh, Brother Jackson's channel. It's called Mecha Wing Zero, uh, and uh, he's got some good uploads there for you to watch. Okay, so the question at the beginning of chapter 23 is, will the new earth be an Edenic paradise? And Brother Austin asked, well, what does Edenic mean? And I think, I think that uh, Randy Alcorn took a uh, kind of an author's license and created a new word. Uh, Edenic would be uh, mean like Eden, like the Garden of Eden. So Brother uh, brother Jackson, what's your first reaction to that question? Will the new, have, the new earth be like an Edenic paradise? It depends on what you mean by like. I think parts of it will certainly resemble it. The difference between Eden and heaven I think is population a lot of. And I think we'll be wearing white garments as opposed to wearing nothing. So, uh huh, yeah. Uh, well, we're going to get to that. There's a chapter coming up about talking about if we're going to be wearing clothing or not. But I don't want to jump ahead. Oh, we have to wear clothing. Oh man! <laughs> I didn't say we will or we won't. I said oh, we're going to answer that man, question. I was looking forward to running in around future. in the rock, you know. In a future. Hey, we're going to cover that in a future chapter. You better but, cover that. So Brother brother Jackson says one of the main differences will just be the size of the population, right? Okay, I think that's a good point. So uh, the, he says, will the new earth be a return to Eden? Some people assume that the new earth will, quote, start over, unquote, with Eden's original paradise. However, Scripture demonstrates otherwise. The new earth as we've seen, includes a carryover of culture and nations. History won't start over with the new earth any more than history started over when Adam and Eve were banished from the garden. Eden was part of history. There was direct continuity from the pre-fall world to the post-fall world. Simil similarly, there will be direct continuity between the dying old earth and the resurrected new earth. Uh, the earth-shaking fall divided history, but it didn't end history. The resurrection of all things will divide Earth's history, but it won't end it. Now, I, I can clearly see the, the distinction he's making there. Uh, do, do you see that this this distinction and what do you take make of it? The point he just made. I think it's a, a growth period. You know, it's it, it's as if as if it, everything had to happen and now. It's growing into something, and then it's almost like the the fruition of a uh, let's say a caterpillar to a butterfly. You know, it's, it, it, there's a transition that takes place, and a cycle that happens. It's, it's what it seems like. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So he's making the point that uh, it's not going to be like a uh, uh, the, the past never existed. It'll be a con continuity. So we'll be aware of all the things that, that passed, uh, just uh, just like we do now. We're not going to forget, um, just like our own identities. We discussed in previous chapters. Will we have our memories? Will we, and if we don't have our memories, then we're not really us, are we? You're not you unless you have your identity and your memories is what identifies you as you from your experiences. And, and, and on top of that, um, if we don't have our memories, then what did we do all this for to begin with? Yeah. Yeah, and you wouldn't even know it's you if you didn't have your memories. And he's saying the same thing applies to this idea of continuity. Uh, the new earth is not going to be starting over. It's be, uh, a continuity, be, and we'll, uh, we'll realize that, wait, okay, now this is just a continuous change that we've gone through. We've gone through the paradise, the paradise lost, the redemption, and now we're in the new, new earth, uh, and paradise restored. Uh, Jackson and Austin, do you want to make a point on that before I go on? Okay. Uh, culture won't regress to Eden where musical instruments hadn't been invented or where metalworking and countless other skills hadn't yet developed. Uh, that's in Genesis 4, chapter 4, I guess it refers to when, when these things were first developed. The fact that God mentions in Scripture these and other examples of technological progress suggests that he approved of the use of creativity and skills to develop society even though people were hampered by the curse. In other words, the things that we have now that are good, like, well, I don't think all music is good. <laughs> there are certain kind of music I think are good and certain kind of music I, I don't think is very good. But uh, music, art, culture, the things that, that a man has done through our creativity, through our God-given talents, uh, even though we're in a fallen state, We've done some things well, and there's some things great that we mankind has accomplished. Some of these things will be retained. It's, in other words, it's not going to be wipe out every musical creation that man's ever done. For example, what do you think of that? I think they should bring black, uh, bring the blimp back. You know, <laughs> I'd love to, to to take blimp rides. You know, all over the all over the planet. You know, with the, <laughs> Travel all over the place, like slowly over there, up and away in my beautiful balloon. No. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think he's making this. I think this is a very, very important, valid point. Even though the curse is removed, uh, and, and that uh, the 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 whole slate is not completely wiped clean as far as the record of man and our memories and our uh, and the things that man has accomplished. Uh, some of that will probably be retained. For example, he cites music and art. Are, are that is that going to just disappear off the earth? Everything man's done, accomplished musically and artistically. Yeah. What about fandom too? A part what? What about fandom also? Fandom. Fandom. Uh, you mean uh, uh, being a fan of something? Yeah, because like they have you know like comic cons and that kind of thing and. And anime conventions and stuff, which are fun in in this uh, in this life. The only thing for me, like like I have sort of mixed feelings about them because they're just so tainted with sin at all these conventions and stuff. And like there's there's fun, but then there's also an element that just makes you feel really dark and icky inside. And uh -huh. if there was sin free fandom in heaven, that could be something I could get really into. But well, you know. Uh... There are some people that we love and respect who their opinion of heaven is that like everything about the earth is bad. Uh, everything in the physical realm is, is bad. Kind of that Christoplatonism idea that the physical realm is evil and everything has to be uh, ethereal, uh, non-physical or, or else it's evil. And they would also expand that and say everything that we've uh, on the earth up to, to the present time it will be wiped out because it's all bad. And uh, Randy Alcorn is making the point that no, some things from our man's history will be. God probably says, well, that's good. Like you know, Beethoven is good, or 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 maybe this thing that you like. Maybe God will say that's good. Let's retain that. Uh, there are some things in our culture 
and man's creativity that uh, uh, Randy Ocorn is suggesting, hey, I think that this may be, uh, it's not going to be completely wiped out like it never existed. I'd like to visit Stan Lee in heaven and see if he's going to write a new series, a cartoon series or a comic book series up in heaven and see exactly what his heavenly, you know. Yeah, maybe maybe Ant-Man will actually catch on in heaven. <laughs> he's a superhero. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and then Legos I don't think are inherently bad. I think they might even be improved up there. Yeah. I don't know. There might be some good things up there. I, I'm guessing that if someone's watching the video at this point and they would say, Well that's kind of trivial. Why would man why would we be doing anything that we'll have bigger things on our mind than that? And I'm we've discussed that in the past. Yeah. Probably a lot of things that we find fascinating and, and you know, really interesting to interesting things now, activities and desires we have now, maybe our desires and interests will be dramatically changed uh, in eternity and maybe we won't even have any interest in, in maybe some of these things that uh, we, think, we think are wonderful now. Some people expect the New Earth to be a return to Eden with no technology or the accomplishment of civilization, but that doesn't fit the biblical picture of the great city, the New Jerusalem, nor is it logical. Would we expect on the new earth a literal reinvention of the wheel? No. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was thinking maybe octagon would be a good shape for a wheel. <laughs> that sounds like quite a bad idea, actually. <laughs> All kinds of new problems with that. Yeah. Well, oh, wheel's the shape of ovals, you know, up, down, up. <laughs> Well, I really think this example here is just a perfect, great example to make his point. I mean, uh, in eternity, will we have wheels? And, and if we, if we're gonna, if we're gonna have wheels, why do we have to reinvent it? I mean, can't we retain something? You know, one of the greatest inventions of mankind's history was the wheel. I would say the ball bearing. <laughs> that just rolls anywhere at once. You know, you can develop some skates that way and. See if you can handle going sideways and everything. <laughs> he says, consider this analogy. A young man has been sick from infancy and is suddenly healed. Does he become a baby again? No. He's a well young man. He doesn't go back and start over from the point his health went bad. Rather, he continues from where he is, going on from there. He doesn't abandon the knowledge and skills he developed. He's simply far more capable of using them now that he's been healed. Having used such an illustration, well, uh, he's going to quote someone here, but first, what's your reaction to that, that analogy there? Uh, you know, we'll be far more capable to use the things. In other words, all the, the, th the talents that we've had and all the accomplishments that mankind has made throughout history, we're going to be far more able to use them well. That, mm. What he said reminds me of what the Lordship crowd says when someone needs to be born again a repeated, you know, over and over. It's at a repetitive state. They don't understand it's a one-time occurrence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And once we have our uh, glorified bodies and we're in the new heavens and new earth, uh, you know, we're, we're permanently made in, uh, as this uh, uh, eternal being in the image of God, and we're going to be able to uh, have capabilities. We'll be able to use our talents and our, our historical accomplishments to, to greater good, I think. Or that's the point that Randy's making. He quotes Albert Walters, whoever he, that is. By analogy, salvation in Jesus Christ, conceived in the broad creational sense, means a restoration of culture and society in their present stage of development. That restoration will not necessarily oppose literacy or urbanization or industrialization or the internal combustion engine, although these historical developments have led to their own distortions of evils. Instead, the coming of the kingdom of God demands that these developments be reformed, that they be made answerable to their creational structure and that they be subjected to the ordinances of the Creator. That is Albert Walters, whoever he is. Uh, well, will there be pollution control? 
You know what I mean? Like, well, they have to put all that pollution. They won't need all that pollution control in heaven. They'll probably use water for a fuel, hydrogen, water, fuel, or hydrogen, and oxygen. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure about the combustible engine. We'll probably certainly have other, uh, either other vehicles that a better form of transportation, or we won't need transportation. We talked before about how we may have the ability to just materialize wherever we want, you know, just appear. Um, We've discussed this in past uh, uh, episodes, and we've got a future chapter where we'll go over that again. So, it, yes. Isn't the, soul, isn't the soul considered, uh, you know, with with Christ, everlasting life, you know, with him, with that everlasting life, isn't our soul considered an energy source? And if so, my question would just be to pertain to what is it made out of, light? Well, I've never thought about that before. That's a totally new idea. Does anybody have any idea on that? Well, I was thinking about that just before I spoke. Uh, Nikolai Tesla had the idea that he would, and, and they're still looking at it today, where they will actually pump electrons into the air to the point where you'll actually be able to light a light bulb by holding it in your hand. And it See. won't electroshock you because your body actually is a conductor along with all the rest of the, the air around you. Yeah. And it's possible that the early Earth might have had more electrical charge, and you might have had a direct ability of moving electrons, and there were more electrons around. So mm -hmm. it's it, it, it doesn't sound implausible that, yeah, we're an energy source. Our body is uh, atomic, if you will, and uh, in get put in a certain at atmosphere, maybe a heavenly atmosphere, we may actually realize we have some atomic powers that we didn't have before. Yeah. Right. Because right. another thing that reminds me of this is that some believers will shine, you know, like the stars in heaven. That was just another symbol or, or uh, symbolic to show that, you know, maybe if we could harness, you know, our souls, not necessarily our souls, but just the matter of what it's made out of as an energy source, because that would last forever. I'd like to say flame on, Johnny, you know, and just... Mm -hmm. Play well, one. <laughs> well I, I find I find this uh, this is really a new idea that you brought up, Austin. I've never really considered that, and uh, these are things that uh, you know may be plausible, possible. Uh, but I can tell you this from my own personal experience. Uh, now we know that our bodies have um, um, a neurological system, our our, our, neur our nervous system, the brain the spinal cord, the nervous system of our body, and, and uh, electricity flows through it. Matter of fact, the, that movie, The Matrix, was talking, used man, men as batteries to draw the electricity from them as a source of energy, if you recall. Right. Uh, and I'll tell you from my own personal experience how much electricity we have in our bodies. Uh, years ago, I had to have brain surgery. And because I had a condition called trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, and what happened is there's a nerve in your brain called the trigeminal nerve, and sometimes it starts malfunctioning and it, it becomes excruciating pain. Uh, they, they used to call it the suicide disease because before, before surgery was possible, people always just killed themselves. The, the pain is the most intense pain. It, it feels exactly like if we got some jumper cables and hooked them up to the battery and then put the jumper cables on your face. Wow. The, the, the electric shock you'd feel, that's what it feels like. And it feels like your, your flesh is being torn and being electrocuted at the same time. So, and that was because of a nerve in my brain that was not functioning right and the electricity was causing this electrical shocking pain on me. Uh, well, through the brain surgery, you're able to go in there and do microsurgery, repair the nerve. So, uh, thankfully, uh, they fixed it, but I know I know better than anybody else how much electricity flow, flows through our body because this was not just a like a mild shock like you know how you walk on the carpet and you get right. electricity and, shock. and you touch someone and you get a little shock. No, this is not a mild shock like that. It's it, it's such a, a horrible shock. It's so intense. You, you you a person would have to kill themselves if they didn't get it fixed. It's just too much to live with. Wow. So that we do have this power source running through us right now, and it's electricity. What caused it, Berluk? Um, they don't know for sure. Uh, sometimes it just wears out for no reason, and, and it's it's kind of like an electrical cord that goes into the wall and into your lamp, 
and it has copper wire and then it has rubber around it. If the rubber gets worn away and the copper wire gets exposed, it you know, gets it, hot. yeah, and that's what happens. They had to actually go in there and put Teflon tape around the nerve. It's like putting tape around a cord. So uh, uh, that's how they were able to fix it. Uh, but you know, maybe because I've had a lot of blows to my head. I really, I've done a, a lot of uh, martial arts in my life, and I've been hit in my head. That could have been the cause for it. I don't know. They told me after the brain surgery to don't get, have any more blows to my head. <laughs> yeah, take it easy, Bruce Lee. <laughs> okay, well, you brought up an interesting point. I've never even thought about that idea, Austin. So who knows? Okay. Um, We'll go on here. It says, will the New Earth start over as a New Eden, or will it contain the cumulative benefits of human knowledge, art, and technology? Uh, life in the new creation will not be a repristination of all things, a going back to the ways things were at the beginning. Rather, life in the new creation will be a restoration of all things involving the removal of every sinful impurity and the retaining of all that is holy and good. Were the new, cre were the new creation to ex exclude the diversity of the nations and the glory of the kings of the earth, it would be impoverished rather than enriched. Historically, regressive and reactionary rather than progressive. To express the point in the form of a question, is it likely that the music of Bach and Mozart, the painting of Rembrandt, the writing of Shakespeare, the discoveries of science, etc., will be altogether lost upon life in the new creation? <clears throat> so that's the question that Randy Alcorn poses, and uh, what, would you, what is, the, is your uh, opinion at, at this point? Is, is everything going to be wiped out? Of the slate wiped clean in terms of all these things? I'd say there would be great amusement parks in heaven. You know, they'll have these places where you can do reenactments of like Sherlock Holmes episodes, you know, even Star Trek episodes, almost like be like like a Hollywood scene, you know, you know where you go to Hollywood and you like you walk into an area yeah. and, 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 and you're in a movie somewhere. I mean, I think that there'll be tons of stuff like that, yeah. you know, back in the 1800s, Wild West, Probably yeah. villages that 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 uh, you know Japanese villages and that that looked like the old towns or old yeah. Salzburg, you know the way it was where they made had the salt mines and they had the grist mills. Mm -hmm. I think all that stuff will be there in one form or another. Uh, Jackson, Jackson, you want Legos and that that other game, right? Oh yeah. Um, the the you, thing is, I, I I was wondering about though, if as Mitch is talking about these public places, I wonder if there'll be street preaching in heaven. Uh, oh, well, why not? Wow, yeah. Why not? If it yeah. was like, cause it, it, it'd all be positive and everything. We wouldn't yeah. have to listen to these heretics and everything. Well, we certainly won't have to tell anybody how to get saved, but we can we can tell people, uh, uh, let's always be thankful to our Savior for saving us. Yeah. Well, I think Paul will be up there probably preaching. Yeah, we will probably be able to go to like one of his conventions, and we might even one of us might even fall off a balcony. I would yeah, I, 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 there won't be any of this rebuking for people's sins or anything like the people Luke knows or anything like that. No, oh, man, not not unless uh, Jackson, not unless your your adversaries who are teaching that thing you call the split kingdom theology, yeah. uh, if if they were correct then there will be some lesser saints who are going to have to be rebuked, you know? <laughs> so you know, that, of a verbal tongue lashing, is yeah, that one guy but, said. But, you know, I don't hold to this uh, uh, split kingdom theology. I don't think any of us on the panel do, and uh, it, it certainly is uh, nonsensical to me. So I don't think that there will be any rebuking going on. It'll just be praising and uh, encouraging each other. That does uh, remind me, though, real fast. Will there be schools? Hmm. Uh, well, I think that everything in in, uh, in our experience will be continuously learning. I don't know if we'll need to go to a a school as we know them today. I think life experiences will be just constantly learning from each other and from from God. But right. that's just, that's just a uh, I I don't have anything to base that on. 
or I haven't. I couldn't argue yes or no about the school. I just that's just just my intuition. That's fine. Uh, but I know that there are some people watching that are going to kind of be mocking and saying, "Oh, Mitch, you know, you want uh, carnival rides, and Jackson wants his interesting his interests, his hobbies." And I want to go back to kindergarten, and I want to do finger painting. <laughs> you see, but there are some people that are think you guys are so immature and trivial. You know, heaven is going to be much more serious than that. But I wonder how much of of the things uh, that uh, we think are fun and enjoyable now, like our hobbies, uh, that, that God will say, hey, uh, Jackson really loves that. Uh, you know, and that, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I don't see anything evil in that. and It's something he loves. I want to let him keep doing it in his, some of his spare time because he loves it so much. Uh, I, I think that some of that will be part of it, but then I also think that there's going to be great serious adventures and, and, and uh, uh projects that God will have us on too that uh, that will be so exciting and learning will be the greatest thrill I think well so I would say that God gifts us you know with certain talents there are certain people who can sculpt there are certain people who can who, who really are great at design and that's what they love to do and when they go up to the heaven it's not that God couldn't make anything and and, and he couldn't just drop it out of the sky and I did a, a video on this, you know, the table that I made. Well, I wouldn't want to go to heaven and have nothing to do. I would want to, you know, fiddle around, make stuff out of wood or, or different projects because that, that's God's gift to me, my work, you know, that gives me great joy to do. Yes. But instead of most people that I've known in my life, and even myself included, most of my work life, now I'm retired now, but but what as I in my work life, uh, I went to work only to get a check. I went didn't go to work because oh this is something I passionately love to do. You don't even have to pay me. I just want to do it. Uh, so uh, most people have that attitude about work today, and they, they, it's not something they really want to do. But I think that in in, in the new earth we're going to uh, love the work that we're doing. It'll be a passion. Whatever, whatever assignments that uh, God feels uh, he wants us to do, whatever projects we decide that we want to take on, it'll be a joyful thing to work. No, that, that's wonderful. Amen. Uh, the next question Randy asks is, how does Eden anticipate the new earth? I don't know what he means by that, but he says, Eden wasn't just a garden. It was an entire land of natural wonders. The Pishon River, originating in Eden, flowed, quote, through the entire land of Havilah, uh, unquote. That's Genesis uh, chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. The precious onyx stone was located not only near Eden, but actually in Eden. That's Ezekiel chapter 28. Later in Israel's history, God commanded the high priest to wear two onyx stones with the names of the twelve tribes written on them. God calls these memorial stones. Uh, not just the names, but the stones themselves were apparently memorials. But what would onyx stones memorialize? The Genesis and Ezekiel passages suggest the answer is Eden. Um, he goes on to say that the onyx stones on the high priest's shoulders serve to remind the people of Eden. The perfect earth that should be kept alive in the hearts, dreams, and hopes of God's people. God wanted his people to look at the temple and the high priest, a symbol of mankind reconciled to God, and to remember Eden, where people lived in communion with God. The stones suggested that in, that in the redeeming mankind, God would restore them to Eden. That's an interesting point. Have you guys were you aware of the stones and the the breastplate with the priest and all that? The meaning of that? No. I, I did read somewhere. Uh, it was a study on uh, Lucifer's gems when when he was you know he had all his gems and I, I did read about the different stones. But the one that intrigued me the most was that uh, the gold, the heaven's gold. How how you know beautifully furnished it is compared to our gold. It's just you know that hundred percent. Perfected gold. I thought that was really cool. How that's going to look. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, the point that he's tr trying to drive home here is that uh, uh, it just as in our discussion right now, we're excited and we're looking forward to our eternity on the new earth, uh, that uh, our, our looking forward to that uh, is, is not something that is, should be unusual. Uh, God intended for uh, the, the, the Jews through the temple, through the priest, all these things to be memorials and give them this hope to look forward to this Eden again. And that's, hope is a, one of the most important uh, qualities a person has to have in life. Uh, and one of the saddest things is a person who's given up all their hope for their future. Oh, That's right. I just, can I read a can I read a verse real fast on hope? I found yeah. it the other day. Sure. This, this is this is pretty cool because it's a it's a cool saying. I would just say I just say that you know faith is patience because you know we're 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 waiting on it. That we already know we have it. We're just waiting on it. And I and I found a verse that literally said that it was Romans eight twenty four through twenty five, and it says, "For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope." For what a man seeth, why do, why doeth he yet hope for? But if we hope for what we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, that's beautiful. Jackson, you were about to say something? No. Oh. <laughs> All right. I thought I heard you speaking, so uh, last thing I want to do is just skip over you if you have something to say. Uh, now his next question is, what will the new nature be like? Wow, that's <laughs> that's a question we all want to know. <laughs> we've never seen men and women. Now uh, we've never seen men and women as they were intended to be. We've never seen animals the way they were, were before the fall. We see only marred remnants of what once was. Likewise, we've never seen nature unchained and undiminished. We've only seen it cursed and decaying. Yet even now we see a great deal that pleases and excites us, moving our hearts to worship. If the wrong side of heaven can be so beautiful, what will the right side look like? If the, smoky, the smoking remains are so stunning, what will earth look like when it's res resurrected and made new, restored to the original. First off, I'd like to talk about the gemstones. Yeah, okay. You know, I would say that since man has scoured the planet to take all the gemstones off the face of the earth, that's why they're, 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 they're hardly ever found, that probably in the new heaven there will be gemstones laying around everywhere. I mean, it, it's just that man has, 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 has grabbed them and now they're, they're, they're scarce. So things like gold, silver, you know, all the elements that are out there and different stones that you see around, uh, you know, and different things that man has done to the earth, will, if the earth is renewed, all of those things will be replaced. And as far as nature is concerned, you know, who knows what our bodies, what, what man's body was like, really like, before the fall. I would imagine that we were much more healthy than we are now, much more strong, you know, uh, um, and, and may even, I don't know that we had like, like pointed ears or anything like that, but, you know, I think we looked about the same, but, you know, and animals may have looked about the same, but uh, I would imagine that the new heaven and the earth, new earth will have some surprises when it comes to different animals that we may have never seen before. Yeah. Wow. I, uh, I've never really thought that much about how your point about, man kind of plundering the earth for, for all its minerals and precious gems and stuff and uh, I'm sure that uh, you know there, there's so much more deep within the earth, the earth there's still a lot left that man hasn't discovered but everything that's accessible man's just gobbling it up and collecting it and taking it for treasure and uh, uh, that's an interesting idea that maybe those things will be just so abundant and that's one of the reasons I mean, could you imagine the most beautiful gemstones and gold and silver and all the most beautiful things? We have this place here uh, near Las Vegas. Um, uh, I, I like to go golfing in St. George, Utah. And the backdrop of there is like Bryce Canyon, Zion National Park, if you've ever seen it. It's called Color Country. It's such a spectacular view. 
and 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 that doesn't even have like gold and, and tur turquoise and all the beautiful stones r running through the mountains and stuff. It's just, but it's still yet it's it's spectacular. And how spectacular w will it be in the new creation if Mitch is right that all that's just going to be abundant everywhere? Everywhere we look is just sparkling diamonds, rubies, gold running through the mountains. And I drove through there. You know, I, I stopped in Las Vegas. It was about 135 degrees, maybe 150, it felt like. I got out of the car. I got back in the car, and we went through, you know, uh, Arizona to Utah. And it looked like, you know, you couldn't uh, wander into the rocks because, you know, you, know you, you get lost out there. You're you're dead, you know, with rattlesnakes and whatnot. But it just looked like, imagine if you could just wander through that whole area. It's just you know, I don't know if you're talking. What you know, what I'm talking about where they have all those, um, like, like miles and miles and miles of rocks and crevices and cliffs and everything. You know, uh, as you go through Utah, I, I, I thought that that was, that was. I would love to just be able to meander through there and find all sorts of different things in there. You know. Yeah. Really cool. But he he makes a point that you know there's so much spectacular about creation that we we can see, and yet. This is the this is the smoky remnant, you know. It's it, uh, how much more spectacular will it be when when the the smoke is gone, it's restored, and just nothing but beautiful. Oh, but then again, the architecture that will that will complement it. You know, I could imagine like bridges that we never saw before, huge bridges, golden bridges, going from one mountain to the other, from one city to another where you'll be able to have footbridges that go across there that are made of gold and you'll be able to walk across, mm -hmm. you know, like, um, like not that you wouldn't be able to levitate, but just, just, I, I could just see some of the scenery like in, uh, Lord of the Rings, you know, where you had, uh, Rivendell. You a lot of, uh, scenes out there that we would have never imagined before. Mm -hmm. Uh, his next question is, will, the, will this Earth's places be resurrected to the new Earth? Uh, in becoming new, will the old Earth retain much of what it once was? The new Earth will still be just as much Earth as the, as the new us will still be us. Quote, the world into which we shall enter uh, in the parousa of Jesus Christ is not another world. It is... This world, this heaven, this earth, both, however, passed away and renewed. It is, it is these forests, these fields, these cities, these streets, these people that will be the scene of redemption. Hmm. So the point is, he's, he's saying that, you know, the, uh, the Sequoia National Park, Yellowstone National Park, uh, will we still have those things? Uh, some of the great architectural accomplishments of man will will that uh, will those still be there? Will we recognize those things? Or uh, you know we we know that the the universe is going to be destroyed with a fervent fire. But when God creates the new heavens and new earth, will some of these things be brought back? Or, because or or do you think that will just there'll be no uh, they won't nothing will be there that we we love like uh, in the Grand Canyon for example. Well, I was thinking that uh, more like Hoboken, New Jersey. <laughs> you know, I mean, they revitalized that city. I don't know how many people have been to Hoboken. Um, my grandfather came from there, and the city had the cobblestone streets on it, and then mm -hmm. it fell fell into the dilapidation. But recently, it's been renovate, renovated, and uh, it's it's a really neat place to go now. And Jersey City is following suit, where that city is fall like that city was very bad with crime. And it's starting to like reform, you know. And I remember the days when we used to go up to the Bayonne, New Jersey, up in the city, and uh, it was cool up there. I liked the city. But then you had, of course, graffiti. You had, um, you know, you had, uh, you know, people that were crime and whatnot. And so this is, uh, and 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 people that just dirtied up the city. So I would imagine they'll have. It's almost like the mafia. The mafia kept the streets clean for, for whatever reason, you know, but we won't ha need the mafia to keep the streets clean. We'll have we'll actually live in a city where, where everything will be like the cleanest, nicest city. And as far as the, others, the parks, I could just imagine that they'll be just as pristine up there. Uh-huh. 
Uh, the, the question is, will these be new parks or will it be the old parks and the old national parks and stuff, but restored again, but perfect? Uh, do you have any any feelings about that, Jackson or Austin? Uh, real fast, what was it to pertain to? Um, is there anything on the earth like a, a national park or a, a river or something that you just love and you would love to see that on the new earth, the same one? Uh, I think Mount Everest deserves to be there. It's, it's a pretty cool yeah. landmark. Well, the question is, will Mount Everest or many of these other things that we love, uh, uh, that, uh, will they be on the new earth or will the earth be totally, uh, all those things be totally different and we won't recognize those things that we, we uh, you know, are so uh, majestic and, and memorable about the earth? Uh, I could go either way and I would say that, it, not to say that they wouldn't be there, but if it came down to it, like would Estes Park or uh, Mount Everest be there? Uh, if it wouldn't be there, my only answer to that would it would be better. It would be a better version of it. That would that I would say that it's either going to be there itself or it's going to be there as a, a better form of it, like it's more magnified or something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that, that, real fast, that does remind me though. Will the Earth be the same size? Yeah, I don't think the, the, there's nothing in Scripture and there's nothing in Randy's book that really. Uh, discusses that I, I, I've never really and that occur, thoughts never occurred to me what if he shrunk us what's that what if he shrunk us <laughs> yeah what if the earth and mankind and everything is, is scaled down to like you know a, a one millionth size <laughs> well I just it would also pertain to would we also have the same uh, equation of uh, ocean to land or yeah. will, we, will we have more land, or would we have more oceans still? Well, we're going to come up to that because there are some. There's a verse in uh, Revelation that says there will be no more sea, like there's not going to be any oceans. So we'll we'll come up to that though. It's it's coming up soon. So no lost city of Atlantis in heaven. <laughs> okay, just 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 check it because I'd love to go there. No, I don't do think have, so. We still have lakes though and rivers. Yeah, well, we know there's a river running from the New Jerusalem all the way through the whole city, the capital city. Yeah. Okay, that's awesome because that that would really that'd be kind of weird if we didn't have any water. Okay. No, I know we'll at least want to float on a gondola. <laughs> uh, a says, Italian music. He says, "Shouldn't we expect then that some of the same geological features of the old Earth will characterize the new?" Shouldn't we expect the new earth sky to be blue? Might God refashion the rainforest or the Grand Canyon? If the earth becomes the new earth, might Lake Louise become the new Lake Louise? Might we travel to a familiar place and say, this is the very spot we stood on. In the same sense, we'll be able to say, these are the very hands I used to help the needy. Maybe. I'm just wondering if it's New Jersey. Because it's a new New Jersey now, so now it's double new. <laughs> the new New Jersey. The new New Jersey. <laughs> uh, well, what do you think of that? I mean, for, for I, he, the best point he makes there is, will the sky still be blue? That's a, <coughs> that's a feature of the Earth, that we have a blue sky. Why, why would we think that we won't retain a blue sky? And if that's the case, will we still have the Grand Canyon? Well, the sky is many colors. I like, no. yeah, I like this point here, too. That's true. It is uh, many colors, but uh, generally it's blue, but there are different times. It looks even more amazing when it's uh, sunrises and sunsets and What's that thing called the Northern Lights? That is pretty amazing too. Yeah, I just really want to see those. But I would imagine that he'd they'd have he'd have that all harmonized. Yeah. He'd have he'd have the clouds making messages in the sky. <laughs> instead of going flying through the sky with a plane, leaving a message in the sky. Yeah, the clouds will actually instead of instead of like making these little smoke things, the clouds will actually make messages. <laughs> Come to the convention center. Paul will be there preaching. <laughs> uh, special special appearance by, by by Jesus the Messiah. Um. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
dinner will be served at eight. You know, that's something like that. <laughs> now, he makes a point here in, in his last statement. Uh, he says, uh, imagine saying, this is the very spot we stood on. Is there a memorable spot in your life? For example, in my life, I got my wedding. My wife and I get married in Hawaii, a place, an island called Kauai. It's, uh, a lot of people get married there because it's one of the most beautiful spots on the earth. And uh, could you imagine going to a place that's very memorable like that and saying, look, remember when we stood here and we got married here? Or So do um, you have any, any opinion about that? you think that's possible that uh, you know, some of those very same places will be also restored? Yeah, there was like 34th Street over there where I got hit by a truck. That's where I, like, you know, that's where my life began. I would say that there would be places like that. I don't know that we'll have, uh, you know, uh, what our memories will be like, but I think it would be, you know, I don't know what God will do, but I would imagine that it would be, there would be, if, if all of our memories aren't going to be erased, then what about our memorabilia? What about what, our what? Memorabilia. The things that we remember, that the places that we went, the, some of the possessions we had. Of course, we leave all our possessions behind, but if there's a new heaven and a new earth, you know, and there was a, you know, a certain desk that I liked or something like this or piece of furniture, I'm wondering if there will be an actual replica of that up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, maybe Mitch and I, since we're getting older here, is, uh, things like that are, are like great sentimental value to us. And maybe Jackson and Austin, you know, they don't think in this in that way. Do you have any sentimental uh, places that you'd like to make sure they're are on the new earth? Hmm. Sentimental places on the new earth. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, not that I wouldn't. Not that nothing that I wouldn't leave because. I've gone all over, the, you know, I wound up in California. I like it here, but I don't know that I would, you know, I wouldn't accept something new. But if there was a place that I really liked and there was a replica of it, I'd, you know, and I don't know what God can do, but I do know that God could do anything. We have, we have no clue. Yeah. We have no clue of the things that are in store for us. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, we, I, I'm sure everybody can understand that a lot of the questions he's asking in the book and um, he, his answers and our, and our answers it's just all speculative some of some of this we have no clue from from scripture some of it we have scriptures that give us a possible answer but, but it's not so clear cut but it's interesting to to theorize and speculate on these things some of it is uh, very very obvious though uh, we're going to move on now first Austin were you about, were you about to say something yeah, that does remind me about uh, from the book of I think I think I believe it's from the book of Acts. The very end it says, and there's many more things that Christ did, but have been written in this book. I'm almost positive we'll find out about those. Yeah, yeah. Because that'd be that'd be pretty interesting to know what else. I mean, because everything else that has been written is already supernatural as it is. I'd be yeah. interested to know what would be so. What, what could possibly be more to it? I would, well, I would say that the galaxies will probably be open. The planets, the galaxies, the stars for travel. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that is what I was going to say. Well, we have a space program because mankind's well, always been fascinated by uh, space. Captain Kirk called it. Other that or Mr. Spock, just give me some ears. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, one or two episodes ago, we, we did a uh, pretty good discussion on this idea that, uh, you know, Scripture says that we will co-reign co with Christ and that uh, we will all have various responsibilities like uh, Jackson's going to be in charge of five cities and Austin's going to be in charge of ten cities and Mitch, he's going to have a pub on the corner of one of those cities, right? And a golf course. I'll be in charge of it. I'll be on it every day. Yeah, but, but we'll, we'll, all, we'll all have... Uh, Certain responsibilities and parts parts of the creation that we will be co uh, rulers and reigning over, and, and then we also discussed the possibility. Well, what about the universe? It's so big. God doesn't create something for nothing. You know, there He must have some plan for the universe, and so it will. Can it be expanded? And will we will we be uh, our our reigning and ruling and our uh, uh, 
uh, this new creation, will we be part of the whole new heavens, not just the new earth? And that would get answer your question about what about a space program? But will we need spaceships, or will we be able to, to travel inter interstellarly uh, without spaceships? I don't know. Right. Okay, I'm, we're going to start chapter 24, and there, it says, "What is <coughs> the New Jerusalem?" Scripture, scripture describes heaven as both a country in Luke 19 and Hebrews 11, and it describes it as a city in Hebrews 12 and 13 and Revelation 21. Mm. Fifteen times in Revelation 21 and 22, the place God and his people will live together is called a city. The repetition of the word and the detailed description of the architecture, walls, streets, and other features of the city suggest that the term city isn't merely a figure of speech, but a literal geographical location. After all, where do we expect physical resurrected people to live if not in a physical environment? So the first thing to consider is, is this referring to uh, the New Jerusalem uh, being a city, uh, is there any reason that we should just take that metaphorically and it's not really a city? But or, or should we say, yeah, it's it's, it's a, an actual city with uh, it has roads and buildings and architecture and people and people that live in it. Exactly. I wonder uh, if that would be a privilege to live there, like the like the new like the promised land, like what we were speaking before with with Moses. I wonder if that'd be a privilege to live in New Jersey. Well, Jackson, what do you say about that? Um, I'll remain neutral. Well, uh, I thought that would be right up your alley because he's asking that question that uh, is kind of controversial in your in your teaching lately. Is yeah. it will it be a privilege to live in the New Jerusalem, or that is is just for select really good saints and the other oh, people? That's smart. What's that? Talking about that specific part. Because, uh, yes, I definitely think that all saints will be able to enter the new city. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because otherwise you have these different classes of, of saints and, and this this split kingdom theology that uh, Jackson has been, been uh, you know, teaching against. Yes, yes. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because... It's, it's important to realize that those who think there are these classes right here mis misunderstand Revelation 22 and um, that where it says, um, talks about those outside the gate. Let me just quickly see. Okay, but Revelation 22.15 says, for without, it's 14 and 15, sorry. Blessed are they that do his commandments. It, also, it says, wash their robes in newer translations that they might have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are, do are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I believe verse 15 very strongly is talking about unsaved people in contrast to the saved in verse 14. The advocates of kingdom exclusion think that 15 is talking about saved people. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why. Obviously, your answer is the logical thing. I mean, that that's they're without. They're without. Those are the lost people. They can't be there. In fact, they are uh, in hell. Uh, they're, they're, that's why they're outside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, I thought Jackson was the guy to answer your question, Austin. He's kind of specializing in this uh Subject. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm actually kind of like Mitch has this thing with James. Mine is against this kingdom exclusion type thing. Yeah, yeah. And I think both of those topics are very worthwhile topics to specialize in. There, there there's an important uh, ministry to um, teach about those things. Well, I think in the city, though, you know, I kind of don't. It's almost like when kids used to come over my house. They used to go in my refrigerator. You know, like they used to come to my house and crash. Like if the door would be open three o'clock in the morning, anybody can come walking in. You know, I, the, my kids and their friends would come walking in the door, and they, 
make themselves at home at my house. So I'm wondering, is this place that I'm going to have in, 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 in my place and I'm not going to let other people who I happen to have love and fellowship with come into my house? Or is everybody going to kind of like share their place? It'll be kind of like Legend of Zelda, Mitch, where you run in and break everybody's pots. Yeah. Yeah, and then sleep in their bed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think uh, the question there would be, uh, uh, will Mitch ever really desire privacy from the other people? Uh, and uh, if he does desire privacy, will we respect his privacy and not impose on him when he's not in the mood? <laughs> I, uh, well, I, I don't know. I think it could be shared. I wouldn't, because uh, no one could steal anything from you. I wouldn't have any problem, you know, leaving my house open. I guess so. It would be a problem if they came in when you're sleeping. But I don't know if are we going to be sleeping. Wow, uh, so that's it. <laughs> I'll be partying. I'll be waiting. I'll be like, come on in. Yeah, bring it. What? What you got? You We have a little bit of fun. <laughs> okay. I, I, I just see it being almost like uh, back in the 60s. I don't know how many people kind of remember it back then. It was a lot of, uh, uh, you know, there was this whole idea of everybody getting along in utopia. And I think that really that attitude back then was kind of like they were looking for heaven on earth. But really the only place that it's going to be like it was or, or like everybody thought back, back then is heaven. Uh -huh. I don't know how many people know what hippies are, but, you know. No, Brother Luke, to answer your question, I did find something. Uh, it was something uh, that we'd want to to see, uh, like a landmark or, or something. And what My choice was 1950s America. I'd love to see that again. Uh, that's always been a, a favorite topic of uh, between my and I have a good friend that we speak on that, that we would like to, you know, see that utopia kind of avenue of, uh, you know, these this wonderful neighborhood, everything's clean cut, you know, it looks really look really nice. I would like to see that. That'd be that'd be my choice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That well, is, I don't think be dr the drive-in theaters of the 1950s. Yeah. Right. Well, I was born in 1950, so I, I know very well how wonderful the 50s were, uh, and I, I long for those times as far as I, I wish. I don't think some of the things that America has changed uh, over the last few decades have been good, and I, I think it was better back then. It, was, it really was the good old days, in my opinion. And then I know people that argue, no, uh, now is the best time because, well, they have their reasons, but I, I disagree. Well, then the people in the 20s would have something to say, too, just before the, the Great Depression. And, uh, you know, and I'm not really into doo-wop. I'm actually into 20s music, you know, all that, that older stuff. So I don't know. I, I kind of, once in a while, my brother used to play doo-wop all the time. Okay. Like, all right, all right. Yeah. I've heard it enough times. You know, I, I think that uh, you've, Austin, you brought up an idea, a concept here that is uh, not even in included in, in uh, Randy's book here. Uh, and... I think it's really interesting to, to think about this, and that is uh, we're talking about uh, what what will heaven be like from our perspective, living in this time in this place uh, in America. But but what would what, how would they uh, if we had someone from a different century, from the 1800s or the, or the sixth century or the tenth century, and they were in this discussion with us right now. Uh, they would be looking at things entirely differently as far as how they would answer these same questions we've been trying to answer. Uh, so uh, the time frame that you live in and the perspective it really gives you a, a way of looking at all these questions we're trying to answer right now that it would probably be much different from someone from a different time and place in history. Right, because also we have to count on the fact that if we do have our memories, they would hold true to those memories and you know, with the not everything would be, not everybody would be on the same pace. So we'd have somebody from 11th century that never saw anything from te any technological standpoint, somebody that died right now, I mean, yeah. we'd have the internet versus catapults, I mean, there'd be a huge difference there, so there'd have to be some, that would have to factor in somewhere along the line. Yeah. Wow, trebuchet builders. I'd like to meet one of them guys and build trebuchets. You know, and then and they actually take castle walls down with a trebuchet. You know, those, those, there's those yard, huge long-arm slingshots that, that throw stones, like, for, like, a mile. Catapults. Cat yeah, well, it's like a catapult. Yeah, trebuchet. Yeah, actually get some of these. Like the people who built the pyramids. Okay, how'd you do it? 
Nobody can figure it out. How'd you do it? You know. Well, you know that the pyramids were a mistake. The original architecture was a cube, not a pyramid shape. Oh, you know, I don't know. That was a big mistake. Okay. Well, it's <laughs> sort of like the wheel. They, they, they probably were trying to use those oval wheels. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just said that because there's a, a commercial on TV that, that, that says that I think is quite funny. Of course, you guys are probably don't even watch TV. You probably got rid of your TVs, didn't you? I haven't watched TV in 20, 30 years, really. Yes. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I have Hulu once in a while, but I haven't had cable. I've never had cable in my whole entire life. Yeah. I got rid of that. when they. What happened was I used to install antennas for a company called Wemeco Home Theater, Channel 68, and they were the first ones to start to like sell television commercial free. And mm. so you could buy commercial free television. And it was a wonderful thing. Nobody had any commercials, and no, and so everybody was getting rid of their antennas so that they could have no commercials. They got rid of the antennas, and the commercials came back. So nobody can have television anymore without you know, uh, free. They have to pay for it, and they get the commercials on top of it. Whereas before, yeah, you got the television for free, you got the commercials, but you didn't have to pay. A monthly bill, so they really roped us in there. They really got everybody on that one. <laughs> That's funny, because um, so, so I know I know quite a few Christians that really are like really anti-TV. They're telling you get rid of your TV; it's demonic or something. And, but uh, I guess I, uh, I, I will I will go so far as to say that it can be a very bad thing if you're uh, if you if you can get addicted to it and waste too much time and and watch the wrong things and put your fill your head with you know horrible ideas. I, the reason why I got rid of it because I hated commercials. I, the, but when I got on the, the internet, I, you know it's like it's like a virtual library. I mean, you can do anything you want with it. You can learn off of it. You can you know right now we can fellowship with it. It's just the internet to me replaces that. You know, maybe that's just my generation is kind of. It's. I think it's still. It's. It's an adaptive kind of thing that you know the kids being born now. They I mean they're already born with a cell phone in their hands. So. Well, I never. That, I, the, oh, go ahead. That's how I feel about on on YouTube. You know, you have this option to what's called monetization, and if you if you if you uh, participate in that, then they pay you every time someone watches a video for a, a commercial that they show. And uh, I really don't like that. I mean, I would never uh, do that, particularly on a, you know, a, a ministry channel. I wouldn't want it to commercialized. Uh, maybe it'd be okay if you had some, uh, like, a commercial channel that uh, you're doing that it's not uh, Christian. Um, but I, I, I really don't. I hate it when I go to watch a video and then I have to watch a commercial before I watch a YouTube video. Just oh, install brother. AdBlock Plus. Yeah, What's there's that? a program. Uh, get rid of all the advertisements on YouTube. Oh, really? You'll have to teach me how to, teach me how to do that later, okay? Yeah, okay. AdBlock Plus. Okay. Uh, and then he says, everyone knows what a city is. A place with buildings, streets, and residences occupied by people and subject to a common government. Cities have inhabitants, visitors, bustling activity, cultural events, and gatherings involving music, the arts, education, religion, entertainment, and athletics. If the capital city of the New Earth doesn't have these defining characteristics of a city, it would seem misleading for Scripture to repeatedly call it a city. Do you think that's a fair conclusion Randy Alcorn just made? Yeah, I think that there, that that uh, there will be cities up there, and they will be just like the cities we have on Earth. I wonder if this means there'll be sports teams up there. I was thinking about Civil War reenactments. The sports <laughs> team is good too. <laughs> well, those are things that will uh, I think we'll discuss that further too in, in next few chapters. But uh, yeah, we'll, the the question some people will th are who are very pious will say, how dare you even think that, that uh, we'll be thinking about spending our time on such trivia, and yet uh, some kind of sports, like my sport, uh, I prefer is golf, and, and um, will I be able to continue golfing with a perfect body, be able to play better golf, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and these various sports and various things that we like for entertainment now 
uh, will that be part of it? Since cities now have these types of things, uh, and if the New Jerusalem is called a city over and over again, why wouldn't these things be part of it? One thing about cities, they can't be congested. Uh, not every day, nowadays, cities we're getting rid of too many parks. You know, there's not enough freedom. There's not enough space that that causes problems, and you know, most of the problems and everything else. So I think that, yeah, it's not so far different that we'll have anything different. But there has to be, you know, this. We have to have the parks. We have to have that freedom. It can't be too congested because I, you yeah. know, it's not a concrete jungle we want to live in. I think uh, there's a there's a there's is a possibility that Jesus might assign you the responsibility of, of making sure that the cities never get congested like that. Okay, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> okay. Just don't don't give me, like, tickets, you know, for, 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 like, for not parking or parking tickets or, you know, meters or anything like that. I'm very upset. Okay. Yeah, yeah well, you and your octagon wheels, they take up too much space. <laughs> Well, I don't have to worry about setting the brake if you're rolling, you know, because it's not going to roll. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the city at the center of the future heaven is called the New Jerusalem. The city is portrayed as a walled city. Its security is beyond question. It is perched on the peak of a hill that no invading army could ascend. The city's walls are so thick that they couldn't be breached by any siege engine, or, and so high that no human could hope to scale them. Of course, the city won't ever be under attack, but its structure will remind us of God's might and commitment to protect his people. Mm. Yeah. Well, what, what would be the purpose of having walls around the city, and such great walls? Uh, Randy's saying it's just to show us uh, it's kind of like a picture of our security in, in, in Christ. Hmm. But we won't have to fear anything. We won't have to fear invading armies or anything like that. So what? why do we need these walls? They look, they look nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, won't they be out of gold? Won't they, aren't they made out of gold? I think the streets are made out of gold. And the gates are made out of pearl. Pearl, okay. uh, when I think of the walls of the New Jerusalem, I remember the morning a pastor came to see me. His teenage son, Kevin, was also his best friend, had died four months earlier. This pastor had recently attended a seminary course I taught uh, called A Theology of Heaven. By God's grace, the class had comf comforted and encouraged this man. As the pastor sat in my office, he opened his hand to reveal a beautiful, reddish, polished stone. I'd never seen anything like it. He said it was jasper, which I recognize as a stone that will make up the walls of the New Jerusalem. The stone was a reminder of his son Kevin and of the assurance that he and his son will live together again in a glorious city with jasper walls. The pastor insisted I keep the Jasper Stone. He said, I want you, you to know I'm praying for you as you write your book about heaven. And I want you to have this stone to remind you of heaven's reality. I often look at the stone and hold it in my hand. The more I do, the more beautiful it becomes. It's not ghostly. It's solid and substantial, just like the place that awaits us. Another another point he's making about that this is a physical reality. It's not some ethereal, non-physical dimension we have to look forward to. Mm. He says the walls would be made of jasper, huh? That's interesting. Mm. Okay, now the question is, what are the city's dimensions? The city's exact dimensions are measured by an angel and reported to be 12,000 stadia, the equivalent of 1,400 miles in length, width, and height. That's Revelation chapter 21. Even though these proportions may have symbolic importance, this doesn't mean they can't be literal. In fact, Scripture emphasizes that the dimensions are given in man's measurement. If the city really has these dimensions, and there's no reason it couldn't, what more could we expect God to say to convince us? I deal with uh, 
whether the dimensions are literal in Appendix B. Well, okay, are you familiar with this idea that the, in Revelation where it gives us the dimensions of heaven? It's pretty 14, big. 14,000 miles by 14,000 by 14,000. Length, height, and width. 14,000 miles. Yeah, that's big. Yeah. That's very big. And that's just this capital city of the new earth. So uh, that brings up the question Austin asked earlier, will the earth be the same size? Well, when we understand how big this capital city is, it makes you wonder, makes me wonder right now is, well, maybe the earth will be uh, much, much larger than it is right now, uh, because if it's not, this capital city is going to take up a large geographical area on the earth. Uh, a metropolis of this size in the middle of the United States would stretch from Canada to Mexico and from the Appalachian Mountains to the California border. Hmm. The New Jerusalem is all the square footage anyone could ask for. <laughs> you ever, were you aware of the, the, the immense size of the city? I mean, from Canada to Mexico, from Appalachia to California. No, wait a minute. Did you did you did you add into their height? Uh, no, it, uh, we haven't talked about height yet. We're going to get to that, but that's that's length and width. It's going to be that square square size, and then the heights will be equally high, fourteen thousand miles high. That's a big place. Yeah, you can fit a lot in there. Uh, even more astounding is the city's fourteen hundred mile height. Some people suggest this is the reach of the city's tallest towers and spires rising above buildings um, of lesser height. If so, they argue that it's more like a pyramid than a cube. Uh, we don't need to worry what heaven will be, uh, that heaven will be crowded. The ground level of the city will be nearly 2 million square miles. This is 40 times bigger than England and 15,000 times bigger than London. It's 10 times bigger, as big as France or Germany, and far larger than India. But remember, that's just the ground level. Mm. Now, he says, given the dimensions of 1,400 mile cube, if the city consisted of different levels, uh, if, and if each story were a generous 12 feet high, the city would have over 600,000 stories. If they were on different levels, billions of people could occupy the New Jerusalem with many square miles per person. Mm. If these numbers are figurative, not literal, uh, surely they are still meant to convey that the home of God's people will be extremely large and roomy. Austin? Yes. I don't I don't think we need to worry so much about getting congested. Maybe you're going to have to find another job. Okay. It, is the Tyus Spear, is that taller than Mount Everest? 14,000 miles? Of course, uh, of course. How high is Mount Everest? Like, uh, uh, What's, uh, six miles? Yeah. yeah. That's, wow, that's, that's, <laughs> that's out of the boat pretty hard. Yeah. Yeah. Must be a very different concept of the atmosphere up there. Yeah, because we can't lose oxygen. That everybody would be dead before then. Yeah. Well, just given the dimensions alone, uh, it does sound like the Earth is going to, if not going to be bigger, it's going to be, you know, there's going to be a drastic change somewhere along the line. Yeah. Well, if it's possible, see, you know, you've asked a couple of really good questions t tonight that brought up totally new ideas I've never considered before, and I, I, I think that. Uh, what's what's to say that the Earth will not be the same thing, but but many times bigger? It may be. It doesn't. It doesn't really uh, speak of that. If these numbers are figurative, uh, not literal. Oh, okay. That, I read that. The cube shape of the New Jerusalem reminds us of the cube shape of the most holy place in the temple in First Kings chapter six. The three dimensions, perhaps suggestive of the three persons of the Trinity. God will live in the city and it and it is his presence that will be its greatest feature. Well you know 
I've heard a lot of people talk about how the this uh, to meet these dimensions, uh, the it must be a sphere. I'm not not a sphere. A uh, a cube, height, width, and depth equal, or a pyramid has height, width, and depth equal. But but another uh, geographical shape uh, that uh, is also has three equal dimensions is a sphere. Height, width, and depth are all equal. Uh, I, but I have a hard time seeing the New Jerusalem being a sphere coming down on, on the earth. But it could very well be a cube. Uh, and he's saying that is the model in the, what is that, what do you call it? In the shape of the most holy place in the temple. Hmm. Okay, so next question is, what is the significance of the city's gates? The city has, quote, a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, three on the west, Revelation chapter 21. A city's gates were important for several reasons. First, they were a place of defense from enemies. Typically, the gates of the city were shut tight at night to keep out dangers. Even Disneyland, the happiest place on earth, closes its gates at night. However, Scripture tells us, quote, on no day will the gates ever be shut. Why can the gates remain open? because the city's 12 gates are attended by 12 angels. Of course, there will be no enemies outside the city's gates. The entire new earth will be filled with the knowledge of God, and citizens from outside the gates will regularly travel in through them. Twelve gates. Well, that seems to... to um speak of all the children of Jacob. Yeah. So, so if it's speaking of all the children of, uh, of, of Jacob, it's also speaking of all the children of Abraham, the father of many. So I would say it's an invitation to all of us. You know, yeah. they say that there's a spot on the outside for the Gentiles. Well, if the Jews were just coming in, just a tribe of the Jews. In other words, if each gate would represented one of uh, Jacob's children, it wouldn't make sense to me. I would, I, I would think that, that, that what these gates represent is the opening of God's glory coming, the, uh, coming through the gate. Yeah. You know, your take on that, uh, I, I didn't even get that as I read this, but I, I, see, I see why you're saying that. A person could speculate that uh, because these gates are uh, the 12 tribes of Israel, that each tribe member from Israel goes through that gate and and that 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 is only for the Jews uh, I, I've never thought about that before but uh, obviously we don't believe that's the case but I can see how our person could argue that Jackson what do you think repeat that sorry well you notice that the 12 gates uh, to enter the uh, New Jerusalem mm -hmm. uh, each gate has the name of a, one of the tribes of Israel Right, and Mitch has brought up the point that uh, that uh, he doesn't think that that's because only the members of the tribes of Israel will have access. And I thought, well, you know, I didn't get that when I read that, but I can see how a person could 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 come to that conclusion that, that you know, uh, Ephraim, uh, Judah, you know, uh, every member, uh, every um, Israelite from that tribe um, uh, who is saved. They they will have to enter through that particular gate because it has their name their name on it. I mean, no, next is there a Gentile gate. That's the, no, exactly what I would say. All of, all of yeah. the gate the gates don't have any Gentile names like. Uh, yeah. So therefore, like, I, would, I would tend to agree with Mitch because there would have to be a Gentile gate because probably the majority of people in heaven will be Gentiles. But. Yeah, yeah, but uh, it I, I think it's just uh, kind of to honor. The twelve tribes, uh, mm -hmm. that's their names, not because uh, each gate uh, that's that's only accessible for those people with that 
from that tribe. Well, I, we're I know... actually grafted into the to, 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 to the to the tribe of Israel. All the Gentiles that are grafted in are part of the twelve gates. You know, I don't yeah. know that they're actually. Well, you're you, you've been grafted in under Ephraim, or you've been gra grafted in under Simeon. But I really think that what it is what they're what it's a, a, an example of the twelve the twelve gates are the openings for the children, all of the children, Abraham's children, the Gentiles, everybody. The yeah. of, of, the, of the 12 sons of, of Jacob, uh, I've always thought the only one that I could find any virtue in was, was uh, Joseph. Benny was okay. I, yeah, I Benny, Benny. Benny was not bad, but, but you know, he was falsely accused of stealing that. Uh, you know, who was falsely accused of stealing the cup? Benny. And that's why they. That's yeah. why Joe. That's why Joe said, "Hey, oh, whoa, wait a minute. Benny's got to stay here." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, I've always felt that the reason that the names of the twelve tribes are there is is to honor them, not because you know, because it has anything to do with access. Mm -hmm. Okay, he says, all the enemies of the kingdom will be forever cast into the lake of fire, far away from the new earth. That's right, Jackson, right? So there's people outside of the gates, they're outside of the gates, they're in the lake of fire, they're not out there. Yeah, I don't think that this well, is some class of believers that were disobedient that yeah. can't be the holy city. So they, they would really, say that I'm one of those, so, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a bad boy. I think, uh, uh, Jackson, I've really been shocked at, at some of the people that are, are teaching that. That's it's yeah, like, been a real surprise to me. That uh, uh, you saw the part three. I noticed you commented saying that was excellent. On yeah. my, yes, I did. On my brief video. Can you believe the quotes of some of those people if you saw that then? Uh, the, the quote, the comments on the video? No, like, oh, no. like if you saw the Duluth Bible video, the quotes that Pastor Rocks are brought up by oh, these. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was really uh, amazing that. Uh, so it, you know, it just shows you that even people so, that sometimes we really admire and respect, and we actually learn from them, and yet they can be seriously wrong in in one way or another. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Uh, I don't know if I read this night. All the enemies of the kingdom will be for, forever cast into the lake of fire, far away from the new earth, so the gates will remain open with no need for searches or metal detectors. Any citizen of the new earth is always welcome, always free to come to the capital city, and even to access the king's throne. The open gates guarded by angels remind us that our safety has been brought, bought and permanently secured by God. The city's open gates are a great equalizer. There's no elitism in heaven. Everyone will have access because of Christ's blood. His death is the admission ticket to every nook and cranny of the New Jerusalem. People won't have to prove their worth or buy their way through the gates. All people will have access to the city's parks, museums, restaurants, libraries, concerts, and anything and everything the city has to offer. Nobody will have to peek over the fence or look longingly through the windows. Well, you can well, tell he, he... Elitism? What's that? There won't be any elitism? I thought that only a small select group of people are going to be in the city and the rest of us are going to be weeping and gnashing our teeth in the outer darkness. <laughs> yeah, it's, so obviously we're happy to know that Randy Alcorn is not one of these people who believes in the split in the split kingdom and what's the other name of it for it? The more extreme branch is called kingdom exclusion. These people yeah. actually think not only will there be a split in classes, but the carnal believers will suffer some sort of thousand-year consequence for. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, at least we know Randy's not in that camp. I'm happy to know. So there's like TSA agents at the gate. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, fast though, that wouldn't make any sense anyway. Just on the on the on the one verse that when Christ says, uh, John eight twelve, I am the light of the world, and Jesus spoke again, saying, I am the light of the world. Any man that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but have light of life. 
if these people are saved, and then keep in mind that kingdom exclusion identifies them as, yeah, they are saved, but they might have been carnal or they might have done something else. Well, if they were cast in outer darkness, they'd have the light of Christ. So why would they? Why would they emphasize the fact that these people won't have any light there? I mean, that they're almost going to the point that they're making a, an error in that statement without looking yeah. at scripture. Well, yeah, that, that that Austin, that's one of the many ways in which this theology fails to realize that that, that these people are lost. Like another thing that could be brought up, right, in keeping with what you're saying, is the parable of the man who, because they, they believe that the man who came without a, to the wedding feast without a wedding garment was saved. And the master says, bind him hand and foot. If he's saved, that means by this point everyone has a new nature there. Why would you have to bind him hand and foot? Because if he has a new nature and he's perfectly obedient, he could just say, put your hands behind your back and don't move them. And he would do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Austin, you brought up a, a, a good uh, argument against their their uh, concept, and as Jackson said, that's just one of many many ways that that, that we could, uh, you know, uh, uh, refute uh, this idea of kingdom exclusion. Okay, uh, the the gates are where people enter and leave the city. The vast dist. Uh, the vast distances involved, three gates on each of the city sides, which measure more than 1,400 miles, suggest each, each gate may go out into a different country, perhaps each with radically different terrain. Imagine the people of every nationality, color, and dress going in and out of the city, and some people living on a task or mission, uh, some going on an adventure, others coming to a banquet, or going to visit friends and loved ones. You know, I just thought that if I was making this city, I know exactly where I would put it. I'd put it in where? the center of the earth. That's where I would put it. How could you I, find the, How could you find the center of the earth? Well, that's the whole thing. The, the whole core would be the whole core of the earth would be the city. Oh, you mean in the core of the Earth? I, I thought, you know, at the center of the globe, but you can't find a center. Oh, of and the, if I it. was, <laughs> it's crazy. But I, if I was putting this city somewhere, that's exactly where I'd put the city. And then you can like emerge out of like different. You can go to China, and from China you can go to you can go anywhere. And I don't know what like, God designed, but I think I could do it better. I'm not sure, but or maybe yeah, He's done really it. You know? hmm? that's, that's interesting. Would it be hot? Who knows what it would be or what our bodies would be like, but if I was put, if I was building this huge city, I would tuck it right in the middle of the earth. It would be spherical, right? And there would be and there would be ways to, to, to travel out of the city to all points of the earth. Yeah. The North Pole, the South Pole, Spain, New Jersey, wherever you want to go. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I've never heard of that. Uh, that's another new idea. Uh, of course, the old idea is that the center of the earth is where hell is, the lake of fire. Well, that's probably where we're going. <laughs> uh, there's going to be a pit that opens up, but you know what? I mean, maybe they've got it better. At least they're, they're closer to the end. <laughs> yeah, for a thousand now, years. Now, real fast, I had a question. Real fast. So the new earth, is it completely new, or is it this earth just re just cleaned up? <clears throat> well, that's the that's the uh, the, the point. Uh, uh, when you, when you use the word new, does it mean that it's uh, absolutely new uh, in in the sense that uh, it's it's not at all the old one, or is it new in that it's uh, it's like uh, uh, you you take a house and, and you repaint it, recarpet it, do all that stuff, and, and you make it you refurbish it, make it. Like brand spanking new, but it's still the old house. But but uh, you renewed. Uh, uh, that that's that's what we're trying to decide. Uh, well, the the reason I ask is because uh, it would prove to the point that let's say that the old Earth right now and it's fallen state and everything, and then let's just say that there is a new actual new one that gets made and this one gets destroyed. If hell was here, also, wouldn't that also be another um, footing or an argument to say that well, hell would be destroyed along with the old Earth? 
Yeah, well, that's that's one of the points I've argued when we were talking about that subject that uh, uh, you know the hell will not the lake of fire will not exist because it talks about recreating the new heavens and the new earth, but it doesn't talk about like recreating hell or you know what happened to hell when everything was destroyed. But uh, that's let's not get off on that tangent. No, uh, understandable. I was just, it just came to my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, but but if if hell was the center of the earth, then you know, and the earth was not uh, like destroyed and remade, then then you could say, well, maybe hell still is on the earth in the in the core of the earth. Some people might might believe that. Um, so people have always gathered at city gates to share news and tell stories. Will people on the new earth be less re relational? than we are now? No, we'll be freed to be more relational without the fears, inadequacies, and sins that currently plague us. We'll be eager to hear other people's stories, and we'll all have our own stories to tell, and we'll be able to tell them better than we ever have. No one will have to wonder if they're being told the truth, since there will be no deceit. I thought that's the interesting part there. Uh, Particularly, uh, Jackson, I'm, I'm, you've been wondering about this. Is, he says, uh, um, we'll be freed to be more relational without the fears and adequacies and sins that currently plague us. Uh, you know, have you ever thought about uh, the uh, Asperger's? Uh, uh, if you'll retain that, if that, if you w wanted to retain it, or if uh, if if that kind of thing, uh, uh, you because you feel a little bit inhibited and. Uh, uh, relationships are sometimes uh, more difficult, aren't they? So, will that be uh, changed? You think? Uh, probably yes, to some extent. The thing is, if I were a neurotypical, I wouldn't be able to enjoy my hobbies in the same way. So, I, yeah. I, I don't think that God would take that away. So. Yeah. So, well, perhaps then the things that are good. About, I, I've seen, and you and Mitch both. Many, many good attributes that, that I think are because of the Asperger's. Uh, and yet, uh, you have some attributes. In, in a way, it's blessings. It's, it's insights. It's determination. It's focus. All these things are can be benefits. And yet, you also have the downside, which are some of the social, uh, being social, that are a problem. So maybe the bad part will not remain but the good part will uh huh maybe so the curse the curse will be lifted will i just can't imagine being relational at all ever it's, it would be very strange to me although i've always wanted to be i was never that person because i don't like to be touched i don't i don't you know yeah. just not a relational person it's very yeah. very weird sensation to to be in a place where where like I'm actually open enough to be like a like a fuzzy touchy feely type of guy. I'm just, you know, yeah, it's not me. Yeah, that's interesting. We well, had a guy. Uh, he 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 died a couple of years ago riding on a motorcycle accident. But he came to my Bible study for years, and he was definitely different. Um, uh, he I, I don't know what the diagnosis w would be, but he had some kind of syndrome or something. He, uh, uh, he he could not stop touching people. He had to reach out and touch people. And he always would like hug people. And, and uh, uh, he, he had some real quirkiness and he was very hard. A lot of people couldn't deal with it because uh, uh, it was too much, too much for them. He, even like Mitch, <laughs> if you were in the same room with this guy, his name was Bob. If Mitch and Bob were in the same room, the, the, the dichotomy, the, the, the tension would be too much. Bob couldn't resist hugging Mitch, and Mitch would be like running to get away. Don't hug me. <laughs> I'd jump straight out a window. I'd jump right out. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Uh, and this guy died, unfortunately, then? Yeah, yeah he was... Uh, uh, his his transportation was a small motorcycle, like a like a, a scooter, and he eventually got hit hit by a car a couple of years ago. So I have no doubt that he's with the Lord, you know. 
And uh, so we'll see him there. And I wonder, I wonder, I, you know, everybody will want to hug him. He'll probably be really happy because he'll get all the hugs he wants, you know. He told me once how he got saved. I, I, I just love this. And he said that uh, nobody in, in his life, nobody loved him. Everybody thought he was too odd and wouldn't ha have anything to do with him. But when he realized that Jesus loved him, that's why he got saved, because he understood how much Jesus loved him. And finally someone loved him. It was just like I couldn't hardly, you know, listen to that without crying over it. But it was uh, uh, that's what drew me to Jesus too. The love, the love of Jesus uh, has for us uh, and other people. They get saved because the fear of, of judgment and hell. Right. I was going to put that in the sermon real fast. Uh, real fast. That's that's a wonderful story that he said. But uh, pre modern day, what we have right now is we have. Too much preaching against sin, not enough preaching again to the sinner. We have, you know, we have this, you know, this. We put this judgmental aspect over people instead of telling them, "Hey, just come home as who you are." You know, it's a free gift. <laughs> yeah, very true. Uh, 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 there are people that feel that if you don't spend a lot of time talking about uh, uh, people's sin and the judgment and hell that you are leaving out something very important and uh, and you're kind of watering down and you're compromising you're not you're not taking a balanced approach presenting the message to them uh, and I, I certainly would not want to uh, say oh I want to omit sin and I want to omit the judgment and, and, and hell I, I don't think we need to omit those things at all but what I want to emphasize Rather, rather, is what we're talking about now, heaven. The promise, the, the joyful promise that, that someone has, Jesus will give them eternal life in this new Jerusalem, this new earth. And, and when people understand the, the wonders and the joys, the ecstasy, the bliss that, that they can receive for eternity, uh, I, I think that's a much more appealing message to them than, uh, than uh, them think, saying, ah, I, can't, I can't believe in a God that's going to, you know, burn people in hell. You know, you you get that a lot. But people who uh, understand heaven—that's why this this subject of heaven is so important, and it's been so neglected. Uh, I, I hope that more and more people will catch on and say, "Let's start telling people more about heaven." Oh, by the way, I don't know if you noticed this, Jackson. Uh, you and Austin both uh, find a, found a little fault in my diagnostic questions a, a few months ago. I said the diagnostic question is, you ask someone, uh, uh, do you think you're going to go to heaven when you die? And, and, and you said, well, I wouldn't phrase it like that. I wouldn't talk about them dying right off the bat. You thought that was negative. And uh, that made me realize, that, okay, I could rephrase it a better way. So in the Bible track that I put together on my video, the question is, do you think you're going to heaven? Wonderful. And uh, I, I think it's a far better way to do it, just by not emphasizing it. Right off the bat, I don't need to talk about death. I don't need to talk about hell, the first thing out of my mouth. I just ask him, do you think you're going to heaven, and why? That's a, that's a wonderful. I like that. Okay, Jackson, do you approve? Uh-huh. Okay. I think that was Austin who, who said that, though. Uh, I think it was both of you. I think Austin and you both were emphasizing that point to me. Sorry, I missed the point. Well, uh, I, I a few months ago in one of these hangouts, we were talking about the diagnostic questions I would ask someone to determine if I thought they were saved and how to proceed with them. And I asked, would I start off by asking them, "Do you think you're going to heaven when you die?" And uh, Jackson and Austin, they were saying, "Well, I, I think that I wouldn't say it like that because." I wouldn't bring up death right off the bat. I think you know that's the very first thing out of your mouth shouldn't be death. And so since then I've changed it, and now the question is simply, uh, do you think you're going to heaven, and why? Uh, and so I, I think it was an, it is an improvement. I think that uh, a person's reaction is going to be less defensive when you when you start talking about death, you know, right off the bat. You know, a lot of people don't want to even think about it. But if you just ask him, do you think you're going to heaven? I have asked that to quite a few people since then, and, and uh, the reset, the answer is is really that their their at their desire built, you no, know, their uh, willingness to dialogue and answer the question is better because of that. Mm. There you go. 
It's a little small strategy, huh? Yep. Okay. Uh, uh, are we to take the references to the city's walls and gates at face value? Some people say no. These descriptions, of course, are not meant to be taken literally. They are vivid poetic metaphors for a reality which is indestructible, gleaming, incalculably precious. If invited for a walk, most of us would prefer a leafy country lane to a street paved with gold. One is natural and instantly appealing, and the other seems lifeless and manufactured. Well, they've never been to Hoboken. <laughs> Yeah, uh, what does, do you, do, in other words, he's saying that some people want to take all these descriptions about the new the new earth and the, the new Jerusalem as, as a metaphors, that there's not really literal walls and there's not really literal streets of gold or gates of pearl, and these are all just uh, metaphors, and, and it's more likely to be just, uh, just a, a street with a bunch of trees and beautiful leaves and flowers and stuff and something like that. Uh, do you think that, uh, is there any reason that we should not be taking this literally and say, hey, literally, the streets are made out of gold? There's no streets in heaven. Sorry, I'm sorry. For, yeah, go ahead. I said there's no streets in heaven, <laughs> right? Yeah. I, it doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't. I, yeah. I say it's literal. I just say, you know, it's, again, I like that Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean none of thy own understandings, and all thy ways acknowledge me, shall direct thy paths. I think that, you know, there's things that we can't understand, and it's made for that way. You know, it's made to be this experience. You know, why would we plan on something that we already can comprehend right now? You know, heaven is a gift, and, you know, what do you do with a gift? You unwrap it, and then you open it up and see what's inside. So I, that, I think that's how it is. I, I, I think it's literal, and even though we can't picture it, I think that's the reason why it's a gift. You know, we're going to find out. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Well, if this person probably doesn't really appreciate cities. There's some people who love New York. They love cities. They don't like the country. You know. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's I it's just I think it's a you know to say that uh, that it's going to be an ugly place. So they haven't seen a nice city. Maybe they come from Chicago or something. I, I don't know, or or the bad part of the city. But really, if you look at the architect of some city, the architecture in some cities, it's some there's some beautiful architecture behind some of the you know the maybe the smut and the dirt that might be around in some places. Yeah, uh, I I think that uh, well that'll finish this chapter and we'll pick up next time uh, with chapter 25. And the question it was, what will the great city be like? We'll go into more detail about this new Jerusalem, uh, the inside of the city. But uh, uh, I just want to get what your appetite and also uh, the viewer's appetite, because the remainder of our study is going to be, uh, uh, I think, very, very interesting, because it's going to be answering a lot of the specific questions that everybody always asks. What we've done up to this point is a lot very um uh, theological issues, you know, like is it a physical reality? Is it a is it some not other dimension, uh, and so on? But uh, it's been fascinating. But look at some of the chapters that are to come right now. We got um, um, will there be space and time? Will the new earth have sun, moon, oceans, and weather? Will we be ourselves, or will we? Will, what will our bodies be like? Will we eat and drink on the new earth? Will we be capable of sinning? What will we know and learn? What will our daily lives be like? Will we desire relationships with anyone except God? Will there be marriage, families, and friendships? Whom will we meet? And what will we experience together? How will we relate to each other? What will newer society be like? Uh, will animals inhabit the new earth? Will animals, including our pets, live again? Uh, will and, and and so on and so on. There's uh those are the subjects we'll be going on in the remaining chapters. So I'm I'm pretty excited that uh, the subject matter we're getting into next. So um, let's uh we'll end this uh, uh study on heaven uh, here for today. Uh, I'd like for everybody just to make any like. Anything from the what we said today that is uh, you think is uh, uh, either really new to you 
or interesting or uh, important to reemphasize. Let's let's mention that before we close here. Um, Brother Austin, what do you think? Uh, just truly, this was a really cool chapter. You know, taking in things that we can't relate to or identify right now, and then you know we can't comprehend it, but we'll be there. And it again that. We're waiting on uh, faith is patience. We're waiting on what we'll uh, eventually uh, find out. It, I'll go with a gift, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up with a you know a salvation verse on the gift. Uh, I, I view it at all as, as a gift, and we're gonna we're unwrapping the gift, and you know we'll find out what's inside once we're there. But right now we're just given the uh, another great gift uh, of God is the is the mind, and right now we can just visualize it the best we can and, and talk about it but uh, I'll go with Ephesians 2 8 and 9 uh, it says for grace you saved by faith and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God not of works lest any man should boast the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ and we get that by faith alone in Christ alone and Jesus Christ said in John 6 47 verily verily I say unto you he that believeth upon me hath everlasting life it's a free gift you can never lose the gift, and it lasts forever. Okay. Amen. Uh, Austin, thank you for participating today. Uh, Jackson, uh, would you say anything that stood out in the discussion today that uh, you think should be emphasized? Um, I just was really, I thought it was cool how we've explored the possibility of taking it literal versus figurative and the literal interpretation is the much better one and everything. This isn't just all some mystical imaginatory image or something like that. There actually will be streets of gold and a city and all this stuff. So I'm really glad about that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that uh, with this, this is episode 19, so we've, we've had 38 hours talking about heaven and I remember in the very beginning one of the things that we were discussing is the the uh, the great misconception about what our eternity holds for us you know that it, we won't even be have bodies that will be floating off in some dimension and it'll be non-physical and and boring and just you know and uh, that that's we've come a long way since then in learning about about heaven uh, and one of the main things that people hopefully we'll get out of this is that yeah that there's a lot the scriptures say about a heaven and the new earth uh, and that uh, uh, for the most part we should take it literally and, and, and say hey it is a literal city and we do have literal physical bodies and it's going to be a physical reality so yeah I agree that's uh, very important uh, so brother Jackson thank you for participating today and, and uh, brother Mitch uh, uh, what stood out today that you think should be re-emphasized? Well, um, what always stands out is that when we talk about these things, you know, it, it, it seems to be far-fetched. But then on the other hand, the people who don't talk of the, about these things seem to sell it short. And for something that we're going to hope in, like, like, what God has made, the Garden of Eden, or better, uh, to take a view that doesn't doesn't have any life in it, and then put your hope in it. It kind of doesn't make you really want what you what 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 you're going to inherit. It's it's short-sighted. Why are you doing all this if if heaven going to be so lovely? It really encourages me to think of the possibilities and know that whatever it is, it's going to be beyond probably my expectations. Yeah. Amen. Uh, thank you, Brother Mitch. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I, is really wonderful about the study on heaven is that uh, the scriptures do have a lot to say about it. Some of it very explicitly and some of it... Um, implicitly where we have to uh, uh, kind of put the, uh, two and two together and come up with conclusions uh, and that there's the more that we study it the more excited I am about my future because Jesus Christ promised me eternal life in heaven 
on, and eventually on this new heaven, new, new, the new earth. So I'm just more and more excited about my future. And uh, we, don't, we don't want to neglect to tell anybody who's watching this video now, if you also are excited about this future uh, in heaven, uh, do you know what you've got to do so that you can have this future in heaven, so that you can have eternal life in heaven and on this new earth? Uh, so we, we certainly don't want to leave you uh, without that information and make you wonder, well, what do I have to do so I can have it? So let me start off by uh, asking Brother, Brother Jackson, uh, could you tell anybody watching it now, what do they have to do so that they can have this promise of eternal life in, in heaven? Interestingly, the easy way to heaven is actually the right way to heaven. And not only is it the right way, it's the only way to heaven. You see, Jesus Christ came to the world. He was sent by God the Father, and he is God in the flesh. He took upon the sins of the world upon himself and was crucified for, in, in place of all of us. He was buried after his crucifixion on, on the cross and rose three days later from the dead and offers eternal life to anyone as a free gift who will simply believe on him, who will simply put all their trust in what he did. This will not work if you have a combination here of it's something, it's, well, it's, it's, it, all those things I just said are true, but I also need to do something like be a disciple or work my way to heaven or repent of sins or get water baptized. If you're trusting in any of those things, it won't work. All your trust has to be solely in what Jesus Christ, the Son of God and God the Son, did for you. Mm -hmm. Amen. I certainly wouldn't want to change one word of what you said. That was. Uh, uh, I hope everybody understands. Let me ask you a couple of follow-up questions to that. Then, uh, would you say that when he died on the cross for our sins, what is the uh, significance of, of that? In other words, if we're someone's watching right now, uh, uh, and they think that uh, they've got to. Uh, um, they want to get to heaven through um, like living a moral life and attending church and doing all kinds of good things. How does that equate to the fact that Jesus died for our sins? Well, our sins are initially what separated us from God and from all these blessings we read about and everything. The only way they can be atoned for and cleansed is by Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, the sinless Son of God, because Jesus lived a completely sinless life, dying in place for our sins. No amount of good we can do can make up for the bad that we've already done. Mm -hmm. Okay, so would it, be, would it be correct if I told people now that um, a salvation and eternal life, um, it, uh, to, to receive that, Sin is not an issue. Definitely not, because it's been paid for. So if you're if you're watching right this right now, if, if you're if you're thinking that you have to uh, somehow get control of your life and and stop sinning and become a moral person and so on, uh, that we want you to know that wait, Jesus already paid for all your sins. Don't think in terms of uh, trying to get right with God by by uh, changing your life. That's impossible. In fact, Jesus already paid for the sin, so sin's not the obstacle. Sin's not the barrier between uh, mankind and God because Jesus paid for all the sins. So then, then if, if he paid for everybody's sins, uh, how do we know? How do we know that he succeeded in doing that and that he does, he does in fact have this ability, this power to give us eternal life and salvation? Anybody can answer that. He rose up from the dead. Yes. So Jesus, you know, the scriptures say that the Father raised Jesus from the dead. The scriptures say Jesus raised himself from the dead. The scriptures say that the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. So, they, and Jesus predicted that he would raise himself from the dead. So we know that uh, the 
the beginnings of the church, the reason they believed in, uh, Jesus was who he said he was, and he does have the power over life and death, is because he proved it to them by raising himself from the dead. So the, the importance of this resurrection is that th that that gives me confidence in saying, hey, Jesus is worthy of my faith. He, he justified, I am justified in putting my faith in him because he proved to me he has the power of life and death. He raised himself from the dead, and so therefore he is able to keep his promise to give me everlasting life and give me resurrection. So that's why these, this, uh, the, the, the cross is so important because now we know sin's not the obstacle he paid for our sins. The reason the resurrection is so important is because now we can know, hey, I can confidently put my faith in Jesus. He proved he has power over life and death. So now He's offering eternal life to everybody. What do they have to do in order to receive it, Brother Mitch? Well, first thing they have to do is they have to believe the things that, you know, and they have to know the secret handshake. And for thirty-nine ninety-five, I can teach them this handshake. They have to send me a check, and, and, and for a bonus, I'll show you the special handshake that gets you higher up in the, in the kingdom of heaven. But really, all you really need to do is ask. Ask, seek, and knock. And yes, you will learn of these things about how Jesus was a Jewish carpenter that came to his own, and his own did not understand who he was. And he died on the cross to pay the penalty for sins. And so... Um, when we see that in history and we read the scriptures of the Old Testament and history, we see an account of this and how this act saved us from ourselves and how this Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Then what you really need to do is ask. Ask, seek, and knock. Just talk to Jesus and and I'm sure, as you ask and seek, don't give up. Keep asking. He will reveal himself to you. And at that point, you'll know. Yes. Amen. So right now, if you've been watching this video, and you want to receive this free gift, eternal life in, in heaven, on the new earth, this, this gift, there's no strings attached. Jesus is offering it to you right now. The only thing you've got to do is come to him to receive it. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Just say, Jesus, save me. Give me eternal life. I believe in you. Okay? If you do that, please put your uh, make a comment on this video. And uh, we'd love to know about it. Okay, everybody, uh, the panelists, thanks again. I'm going to end the live, live stream right now. And then, uh, of course, I look forward to talking to you guys after the show. So let me end it right now. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.